means listeners, readers of our book and viewers of this video, which is also a radio program. So I'm Rhonda Chervin. This is David Dow. This is Zoom 5, which is introducing you to our book, Always a New Beginning. And we start with prayer. Oh, dear Jesus. We thank you for the graces of the Holy Spirit to work on new beginnings in our lives by means of this book. And we thank you that it's published with beautiful photos. And we thank you for our readers and our listeners and viewers of this Zoom today. Please bless all of us as we proceed. Amen. Dear Lord, we are gathered together friends, followers of Christ, with all our imperfections, with all our weaknesses, with all the mistakes we've made in our lives, and with the times when you were present and maybe something worked for us. Um, this is a journey. We're going to discuss a journey in the Corona Relocation Chapter, Chapter 10. But each of us is in our own particular journey. And the openness that Rhonda brings to each of these discussions, the instruction that she brings, and the prayerfulness she brings are, are directions that have helped me in my life, and I hope can help you in your life. Amen. So chapter 10, Rhonda, is a commentary on the early hopeful responses to coronavirus as our lives directly were impacted in March of 2020 by the onset of this uh, threat. And something that you and I noticed, I think, in the very beginning is that the fragility, the fragile nature of each of us as humans was, was being tested. I was faced with a decision on the very day I made my consecration to St. Joseph. I was in Florida. I was in touch with friends in Florida, and then I got in touch with my family. You know, my grandmother always said we want to make decisions as a family. And so I spoke to my son and his wife, and I spoke to my brother. And I said, you know, this is these are the news that we've been hearing. We had heard that China was closing their borders. We didn't know if different states might be closing their borders. So my son called me up later the very same day and he said, Dad, we want you back in New York. And there I was in Florida, 1,200 miles from New York. Well, this was a major new beginning. The question is, was I ready? Well, through the grace of God and the consecration of St. Joseph, I felt a real calm. Plus, I had the opportunity to be talking with Rhonda and family members during these next several days, which we, we discuss in this chapter. In fact, our chapter is a day-by-day -day journal as I drove the 1,200 miles from Florida to New York. You know, it's astonishing to review these experiences now. I packed and delivered 19 boxes on December 20th to the UPS store to mail to New York. I changed four tire, had four tires and an oil change done on my car. I went back to my little apartment here and I packed all the remaining uh, goods and stuff I had closed in my car. And on the morning of March 21st, I set out on my journey. Yeah, now to understand how amazing this is, because I was following this, you have to realize that um, Dave, as you'll read in the book, you know, having these difficulties with bipolar and things like that, even harder than for other people as anything that's a shock, anything that leads to, that, you know, causes anxiety. So I was thrilled that he actually pulled this off, you know, and it was God's grace. And I think many of us have stories like St. Joseph, St. Joseph, okay. Um, St. Joseph helping him 
to deal with this in a wonderful, fast, efficient way and not to not to go into drama queen, this is king, this is unbearable, I can't stand it, I'll never get there. Instead, he just took the steps to get to back to where his son, he has one son who he moved near to in retirement in Rochester and just to obey his son's advice and just go and do everything necessary. David's middle name is Joseph, and um, you know I I I'm I'm guided I'm guided with this awareness that Rhonda just introduced even in the moment because you know I still have issues of anxiety in myself, but at the time I remember I was just very focused. You know the beautiful example of Saint Joseph the worker. I just came back to my apartment and I just you know I had the supplies I needed, and I I I re I responded to just an ongoing focus on the work and you know this this song pressing on is a beautiful song i love from uh, bob dylan and this idea of pressing on is a theme is a theme that i sometimes go back to when challenges you know um surge and become evident in my daily routine um pressing on the service of our lord pressing on with the guidance and peace of saint joseph pressing on in the knowledge that i was growing closer to my son and his wife every day. So as my daily mileage was, you know, accumulating, we noticed these impacts of change. These are rapid impacts. And we acknowledged that we were getting jumpy. And to be able to talk with Rhonda and acknowledge that the new normal that we were facing created changes in our interpersonal relationships, changes in my location. And we, we could talk friend to friend and listen to the guidance we could provide each other. Now, with the pandemic effects smothering the airwaves, we also experienced fear. And, you know, with my background of bipolar and depression, fear is a biggie. And to be able to discuss the impact of my consecration to St. Joseph and then talking to my family and friends, I began to realize that I was taking actions, the best actions I could under the circumstances. Plus, I was blessed to be driving through this beautiful country of ours, going north on Route 95. So these are, you know, accumulating and I'm feeling more peaceful. And I reached New York on um, March 23rd, which is a couple of days before my son's birthday. And I got a major shock. I drove up to his house and I parked my car in his driveway, proud of the peacock because I had on the journey, right? David came out of his house. He's big, he's tall, he's a soccer player. Um, let's say he's handsome. And he stood at the trunk of his car, leaned against his car and delivered the new normal, EDQ. I was immediately stunned talk about drama king all right i was facing drama king but this was a real stage i mean this wasn't even stage this was real life and dave explained to me the steps i would need to take in order to stay healthy i would shelter in place i would wash my hands i would use the the um um practices that he was giving to me. Memory doesn't recall all of them at the moment, but I wrote them down. And when I got back to my house, I wrote them down and placed the, the, the list of, on my refrigerator and I called Dave and I read them to him because I wanted to adapt. I wanted to be able to adapt and take this seriously. I'm a pretty mild mannered guy most of the time, but the urgency was something that I understood was a new beginning. And then Rhonda, Mother Nature sent me the most incredible glimpse of natural instinct to defend our family. In my little, um, um, you know, double wide on the shore of a beautiful lake called um, Canisius Lake in Western New York, I had windows and I had a window in my kitchen and 
there was a beautiful tree just beyond the window. And there was a robin in the tree who was seeing his reflection in the window and attacking the window. So he was flying right into my face and I could see his beak going right into the window. And one morning I woke up and I found, the second morning I woke up and I found the window was bloody. And I was like astonished at this um, fierceness and this sacrifice that this robin was making. And so I, I investigated and I discovered there was a nest in some shrubs right beside my house. Now, it didn't take long for me to realize that this robin was defending her young, or maybe his young. And I reflected on this, and I realized that these are instincts each of us have, each of us experience within our own families, for our own parents, brothers and sisters, children. And I don't have the poem with me, but I wrote a poem and shared the poem. And I can tell you that... Um, well, it's in the book, isn't it, the poem? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't think it is, to be honest with you. Because I wrote the poem... Well, I don't know. It could be. <laughs> yeah. remember, right? Uh, but the point that I want to say is this is an awareness that I feel as part of this... Um, consecration to St. Joseph as part of the work that Rhonda and I are doing and being open to the spiritual graces that our Lord sends us in nature. Remember we talked about the nature that we encounter. This sense of defending the family is one that sustains me to this day. Oh, okay. Very, very nice. And so you have questions at the end of the chapter, right? Right. In fact, I'm just checking. We, we actually... Uh, uh, have a we have a list of the new normal and you know we have a schedule I establish a schedule for myself but I did not include the poem so maybe in, in a later zoom we can include the poem but um, for the reader as you recall your time during the coronavirus threat what were the challenges you faced physical economic and spiritual Amen. So the point of the point of the book is not just that we should describe our journey to spiritual growth over a two-year period, but but also so that you, when you read the book, and also you could do this in a group. You could easily use the group, the book in a in a group setting in your parish, and. Um, we're, while they're listening to this, they're, they're listening or viewing this, they see the cover of the book and how to order it right there on the screen. So, okay, so going on to my next chapter, that was chapter 11, and it's the first one on being loving versus trying to control the family. And this morphed into three chapters because it's so huge. And I find when I talk about this subject, these subjects, that everyone I know who is older, you know, any adults who have children or even ones who don't have, who never had children, which are many single people who didn't have children, we still have the temptation always to try to control family members, if, even if they're nieces or nephews or sisters or brothers or whatever. And so we, this morphed into three chapters, but we're going to tell you about, uh, we're going to start today with this one. And uh, each of us reviewed our family backgrounds, which are so different. And um, so, um, one of the very good things that someone, what a family member did for me, I have very techie family members. So I paid a grandson who's a tech expert to make photos of all the photos I had on collages on my walls and make them into the screensaver so it goes around every day 
And every day, these same family members, some of whom um, have difficulties with me, let's say, <laughs> they're always smiling because everyone smiles for a photo. So it's very healing. So I would recommend that to you. <laughs> Anyhow. Okay, so my family background was that I was brought up in an atheist, totally atheist uh, family. My parents weren't married. My father left when I, we were eight years old. Um, we had, um, I never met my mother's parents. They had died, they had died or were away uh, out of the country when I was born. And so anyway, so now I am a grandmother. I am, I was a wife, I was a widow, I was a mother. I was a grandmother, now I'm a great-grandmother of five ch children. Okay, so I have a huge family, and what am I doing in this family? I'm always trying to control them, especially about religious issues, because my daughters left the church when they were 15 and still are not back in the church. And um, my son, who was stayed in the church, uh, my beloved son committed suicide when he was um, 18. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of issues where I want to try to control the other, them, the ones who are alive, my children who are alive. Then my grandchildren, I used to take them when I was living with them at different times, I would take them to church but most of them have dropped out of the church. So, okay, so I'm always trying to influence them. And then when I try to control them by giving them books of mine to read, <laughs> improving literature, et cetera, et cetera, um, if it doesn't work, I get into this syndrome which is called fight or flight. So instead of a win-win, if I can't win them over, then I think, oh, I'm not going to even talk to them anymore. <laughs> this is hopeless. See how drama queen that is? Instead of saying, okay, as one of the wonderful prayers I found since I wrote the book, there's a wonderful prayer about the family where it says to Jesus, you save them. And in the meantime, it says, the prayer says, I will not try to antagonize them with words. Instead, I will be prayerful and loving instead of antagonizing them with words. So that's my first control of the family chapter. And Rhonda, yesterday I had the privilege of, of meeting a man uh, in the parking lot of the grocery store. And he was driving a Jeep. And on his Jeep, he had um, some symbols from the Marines. And, um, you know, one of the people who wrote a recommendation for our book, which is on the back of our book, um, is a retired naval officer. And he and I discussed this. Um, the gentleman I spoke with yesterday and I discussed this. And I related your upbringing to him. And I related the experience you had growing up in, in, in New York with your parents and the, the challenges that you faced in the very family of your origin. And he and I challenged, he and I compared them to the challenges we face as a culture we're living in today. And we both agreed, we can learn a lot from an 83 year old lady. Oh, that's nice, yes, yes. Okay, now I asked the, re uh, I asked the reader, what was your family like? What were the control issues and fear issues in your family? And how do you try now to control family members in ways that you should realize you can't control them? Um, one of my main um, adages is something that it, I, when Jesus told me in my heart one day when I was trying to control them and failing. He said, you didn't create them, I did. You can't save them, I can, period. <laughs> See, <laughs> so we have this idea that we can control them as if 
as if we were determinists, determinists of people who feel that every person is totally programmed by their environment and they have no free will. So we act as if our kids have no free will <laughs> and they should just they should just do what we say. But of course, it's very understandable because originally as parents of little kids, they have to do what I say and we have to control them. Otherwise, they would walk right into the fireplace. Rhonda, I want to jump, I want to jump in because this, when, when my marriage broke up, I took a bus from Rochester back to where I grew up in um, Western Massachusetts. And my brother... Jim met me at the bus station and he took me to my stepmother's house where I had a 30 day period to kind of get my feet underneath me. And um, as Jim was departing and I was in tears, he looked at me and I was broken up because I had been separated from my son and I didn't know what would happen to David. And Jim looked at me and he said, trust the wisdom of youth. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, well, this gives you an idea, and so of what that ch those that chapter is like, and we have two more zooms to do for our introduction to our book. But we want you to know that if you buy the book and actually try to work on the book yourself or with a group, you can email us with questions and we'll be happy to dialogue with you and, and have you enter into this dialogue. And meanwhile, as a closing prayer for this video, or this Zoom, oh dear Jesus, any psychoanalyst could go through the story of our lives and see how childhood traumas affected us and how we feel traumatized and therefore we want to control everything. But you are the best psychoanalyst, dear Jesus and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and please help us to trust in you. We thank you for all the counseling we have gotten in our lives. I have many, many wonderful, wonderful psychological counselors. We thank you for all that counsel, but in the end, we want to put our trust in your sacred heart, in the immaculate heart of Mary, in the heart of St. Joseph, and help us to be healed from family wounds and help us not to be so, con so controlling or try to control other people. And could you add to that prayer, David? Dear Lord, Echoing these words from Rhonda, I'm reminded of Father Frank Pavone's homily this morning. Father Pavone says Mass at 10 a.m. every day on endabortion.tv. This morning he was reflecting on the readings and the gospel, and he reminded us of the role of charity in our hearts. Charity in our hearts toward the people who we love, toward the people who we encounter, toward ourselves. And I'm reminded of a reading I once did on one or another of the saints, and Rhonda's read most of them. I don't I haven't read as many as Rhonda, but this this thought came to my mind. Oh Lord, create in me a liquid heart that I may reflect back the gentleness that you have shown me to others whom I encounter. And then I remembered something that my spiritual director provided me. And this is so fascinating. I feel this is something that has happened between Rhonda and I during this um, series of Zooms even, following the work we've done together over the past several years. My spiritual director is a, uh, a Cistercian. He follows the rule of St. Benedict. He's been encouraging me to study this beautiful um, chapter seven, um, on humility. And in, in a reading that he provided me to, to um, uh, follow up with, he, uh, there's a chart that describes um, the, where, where we in, encounter Jesus and the chart suggests we encounter him in our intellect and where we encounter the Holy Spirit. I made reference to this in our last uh, couple Zooms ago, but 
I went back and I reread this. We encounter the Holy Spirit in our relationship with other people. Amen. And may that be very good. And now we leave you and God bless you. And we'll be, you can next turn to Zoom six and seven after we do those in a, in by a week from now. Uh, but they'll all be up, but the, all seven will be up on the um, on root books under always a new beginning for you to listen to. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. God bless.